and we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Roadrunners Unfiltered. It is your host, Darian Starling. We have a fun episode today. I'm excited about what's on the docket. I got to get my workouts done a little bit uh, earlier because I'll be tired whenever we start these things. But anyway, uh, yeah, we got a lot on the docket. I, I want to go through the UTSA All-Decade team, looking at the last 10 seasons, right, from 2013 to 2023. Um, I want to look take a look at, you know, I'm only going to do skill positions, but I was thinking about this uh, uh, today, and I think we did something similar about, like, best player at every skill position uh, a while back. And, yeah, I want to go through that again. I want to do a similar exercise, but, uh, do it a little bit different. So I'm going to go, you, this is going to be your official Roadrunners Unfiltered all-decade team. That's going to be fun to do. Um, also, just a couple of housekeeping notes before. Later on in the video, I'll let you guys know who's who's uh, coming on to the show next week. I uh, got a pretty, pretty, pretty big announcement. Those of you who are members uh, got a video earlier today that sort of made that announcement already. So if you are a member to the show, or a member of the channel, uh, yeah, you got a little bit of a, a, a peek behind the scenes on what I've been planning on, what I've been looking to do. So um, take a look at that whenever you get a chance. I also posted some content with regards of what the show rundown was going to be earlier today as well. That was for members only as well. So yeah, trying to kick up some content for members. So we'll get into some of that later on. But if you are new here, and you're watching this video, you're with us for the first time, uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Always, guys, like the video. That's always helpful to the channel so we can get more people here. And also, of course, I'm sweating again. Yeah, I got, I'm prepared this time. I have a towel. But also, uh, um, yeah, if you guys are subscribers already, if you would like to join the membership is going to be some exclusive content there as well. And then also, if you want to donate to the channel with a super chat, that would be great as well. I am trying out this new time of six o'clock based on about uh, based on uh, how many people who are, are actually here live. I don't know if everybody got the memo, but Angela called for it. Um, she's one of the members of the show. And also I put a tweet out and a poll on what, what do you guys like best? 5 30 or or six o'clock and everybody pretty much i think 79 almost 80 percent was six o'clock so we're here at six o'clock and no not not too many folks are here but the show must go on <laughs> um anyway so we'll go ahead and get started on the first topic which is the utsa all decade team from 2020 2013 to 2023 I, I would love if you guys would post your um, all decade selections by position in the comments. Um, if you'd like to participate, I'm going to go through each position. So I'm going to do quarterback, running back. I'm going to do two receivers. I'm going to do a tight end. Then on defense, then I'm going to go to defense. I'm going to do, uh, I'm probably going to give you two linebackers, two corners, and two safeties. That's how we'll do it. And then after this, I'm going to post it to the Twitter and all the other places and see what everybody thinks. But um, I thought that would I thought that would be a good thing to do. It's fun. There's not a lot of UTSA football news, to be frank, because they I think they're on spring break right now. Um, so, yeah, we'll go from there. Also, I would if you guys could, whenever you get to this. If you could leave in the comments, if you want any ba any basketball coverage also next year, I was watching, I did catch the women. So I don't typically watch UTSA basketball, but I caught the women's game and the men's game today. And uh, yeah, both heartbreaking, both heartbreaking. And I see there's a lot of folks. Um, there's a lot of folks who are what do you say, calling for, for, for the head coach's job in basketball. That's interesting. Anyway, uh, back to the decade team. So quarterback. So I have three people that I'm considering for, and I think I'm going to make a, I wonder if I can share my screen here. But I think I'm going, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this, I'm going to put faces up if I can. 
as we go through this. Because so I think this will be kind of cool to do if we can. I might actually not do this because my 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 uh, the way I make my thumbnails and my art, it takes me a while sometimes. But for quarterback, there are three people I'm looking at, right? You have Frank Harris, obviously, Dalton Sturm, and I think Eric Sosa. Eric Sosa did play in uh he was not he was 2013, I believe. Oh crap. That's gonna screw things up. Let me check this real quick. Yeah, he played through 2013. I believe so. I'm just gonna say he did. Um for quarterback, I think the obvious answer is uh Frank Harris. I think he did way too much. Um, he did way too much throughout his career to not take that take that job. So quarterback is actually one of the easier positions to pick. Although I love Don Sturm, I, I love Eric Sosa. I thought quarterback was a really really easy one to to uh, decide with. To be completely honest, I think uh, Frank Harris. Um, I mean, we ha- we've had him on the show. He, he he was a legend. He he owns all the records. That's it. That's a pretty easy one to go with. The second one I'm gonna go with uh, on the running back side. So th- this one's a little bit tougher. And it's just, well, it's not as tough. But I'm I have three finalists. I wanted to go four, but I'm gonna go three finalists at running back: Jarvion Williams, Jalen Rhodes, and Sincere McCormick. If you look at all three of them, they ha- I think Sincere McCormick stands out, obviously. Um, but I think, yeah, it's hard to go. It's, 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 it's almost a no brainer to go with him as well, to be completely honest. I think Jarvion, Jalen, not so much, even though he's been on a show, Jarvion has a really good case. I think the best case against sincere, he played in my opinion, I think Jarvion was a better pass catcher at the backfield. I think he actually did some things better than sincere, but I think sincere as a runner was just on another level, to be completely honest. So uh the all decade team for run, starting running back for me would obviously be sincere McCormick with that. I think it gets a little bit more interesting at receiver. At receiver, there's three names that come to mind, in my opinion. The three names that that I have that come to mind for me is Zachary Franklin, Joshua Cephas, and Cam Jones, actually. You can go Kerry Thomas, too. You can go Kerry Thomas. I guess I'll put four names since I said I was going to do two receivers. You can go Kerry Thomas, actually. I, that's That one is that one is tough. I, I think people forget how good he was when he was at UTSA. People forget how good that kid was when, when he was here. Yes, he, he had a pretty big he had a pretty big last couple of years. Here, but I think uh for me, Joshua Cephas, UTSA legend, he didn't leave us early. He's gonna be uh he's gonna have a spot that's locked. That's the next spot is gonna be tough for me because obviously Zakari Franklin could be an obvious go. But if I'm being honest, and when I think about an all decade team and I think the way Zakari Franklin left, it kind of rubs me a little bit of the wrong way. Then I kind of not in a, not in a bad way. I just I don't blame him for leaving, but it, I don't know. It left a sour taste in some folks' mouth, to be frank. Um, and I don't know. But when I look at a Cam Jones and I look at a Kerry Thomas, I think Cam, the way he was utilized at UTSA and what he was, you know, what he was about at the time, he was sort of the Percy Harvin of our team. He wasn't a conventional receiver, but he play, he made conventional receiver plays as well. He ran the ball very well in the in the backfield and in that offense. The way he was utilized in that offense, he did not get the same amount of opportunity as somebody like a like a like a Zachary Franklin would, would get, or even a Kerry Thomas. We start to open the ball up a lot more once we switch coordinators and we switch that sort of balance style. We start spreading the ball out more. Our receivers start to obviously have a lot of big numbers. And then also what you started to see as we shifted out of the Coke era into the Wilson era and into the uh, um, into the trailer era, you started to see us not be the team that says, oh, everybody's going to play. We're going to have all these rotations and we're going to have 
all these different personnel packages that sort of tip defenses hats whenever whenever we 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 did switch to certain personnel um you start seeing these players and individuals start to put up more gaudy numbers but um when I look at Cam, when I look at what Cam Jones, I think if he got more of the ball and he was in more of a prolific offense, I actually think that he would have been just as uh, prolific and had just as many gaudy numbers as a Zachary Franken or Joshua Cephas. But for the sake of this, I think it's hard to leave Zachary Franklin out. And I'll go there. But I, I really like to put Cam Jones there, if I'm being honest. I'd be interested to hear what you guys think. It's Rab said Cam Jones was a beast. Yeah, he was, 1,000%. He was a beast, 100%. It's Rab also talks about, uh, referred back to what I was talking about with the men's head, head basketball coach. You know what? I'm going to come back to that one. I'm going to come back to that one because I, it would be great if you guys in the comments could, or it's Rab, if you could um, – Give me a little bit more context on I, I've been seeing a lot of this over the years about, about folks calling for his job. How has he kept it this long? That would be my first question. And has our basketball team been that bad um, over these years? I seen a stat earlier uh, that was that was re relatively alarming with regards to the wins that they had in conference. So uh, I'll get on to that once I finish this. My all decade team. OK. Um, Let's see, tight end for my all decade team. There's only two that I'm really thinking about. I'll be interested to hear for you guys who are historians and been watching UTSA for a long time. If you had one tight end you could choose, who would it be? David Morgan or Oscar? Big Oscar. I'd like to I'd like to hear what you guys, you know what? I'm gonna put a poll up in the chat. I'm gonna put a poll up in the chat here. I don't know if I can do it. Post the comment. I'm not going to put a poll up because I don't think I can do it right now. <laughs> anyway, I'd, I'd be curious to hear what you guys think on Oscar or David Morgan. I'm literally torn on this. I think David Morgan. I'm, it's, I'm probably going to go David Morgan. I can be a little biased. I played with him. I seen how big time he was. He did get drafted. Um, but I don't know if he if he is as beloved as beloved as Oscar is in San Antonio. Oscar just embodies UTSA football in my opinion. And 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 I the you know the clutch, the big the catch, as Frank called it when he was here that he made was huge. And uh yeah, I think I think um yeah, I don't know. I, I just think Oscar has a, a special he has a special place in folks' heart, in my opinion. Um this year. Or not this year, just overall, but I would say David Morgan. So so far, that wraps up my offense. I got Frank Harris at quarterback, sincere at running back. I have Franklin, Franklin Cephas at receiver. Actually, no, screw that. I'm gonna scratch it. I'm gonna go Franklin. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go Cephas Cam Jones at my receivers. I'm going to go um, Oscar. No, I'm sorry. David Morgan at tight end. Defense. I want to go to defense. Just going to do three positions on defense. Then I'll move forward. Uh, linebacker. Who? There's three linebackers that come to mind, in my opinion, if I'm putting together an all decade team that you just, I just feel like you got to have them there. And maybe I'm just going to not pick two of the three and just take all three, but Josiah Tawaefa, Jamal Ligon, and SK. Remember Stephen Kerfis? Y'all remember him? It's back in my, my days. Last year he played was uh, 2014. Yeah. I think uh, he has to be in the conversation. So if I got to take two of those, the question is who am I take? Who are you taking? I think Tower Effa, without question, you got to take him. But the Jamal Ligon and the SK one and Stephen Kerfis, that's a tough one. Um, and I'm going to tell you right now, my bias is probably going to come out, but I'm going to go Stephen Kerfis first. I'm going to go with him. SK, Tower Effa, uh, 
so much talent between those two. Could you imagine if we had both of those guys at the same time? Pause. Uh, that would be crazy. All right, corners, of course. My 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 I am excluding myself and my bias for myself. But corners, I wouldn't make the list anyway. <laughs> uh corners, all decade. UTSA all decade. There's four corners I'm looking at here. And I don't know. This this was gonna be tough. So the four corners I'm looking at is Bennett Okacha, Cam Alexander. Corey Mayfield Jr. and Tariq Woolen. In my opinion, those are probably the top four corners we've had in the in the program thus far. You could make a case for Devron Davis, but he was he was uh, a little up and down for me. I didn't I don't know something about his uh, his style that wasn't. Uh, great for me, but he was really good. To be fair, he's really, really good. Um, but he's he's off my list. If I had to choose two, this is really difficult because I think Cam Alexander has probably some of the highest ceiling of all of them. If I'm being honest, Corey Mayfield was a favorite of mine. He was really, really good. Uh, Bennett, I obviously played with Bennett. I seen him practice and I see him play every day. Um, so I, I do have biases there and I want to check them at the door. Tariq Woolen, obviously he had a good career at UTSA, obviously has went on to the NFL, but I'm not counting the NFL stuff. <sighs> if I had to pick my top two corners on a UTSA all decade team. I am probably going. I'm sure people are going to disagree with this. I'm going to go Bennett Okacha. And I'm going to go. I'm going to go Bennett Okacha and Corey Mayfield Jr. Cam Alexander left us for Oregon. It's the reason I can't go with him. And Tariq Woolen, although he was really, really good, he was injured quite a bit in his career here. Um, and I just think Corey Mayfield was really, really good. He was really, 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 really good. So there you go. Safety, two safety. There's three safeties that come to mind for me off the muscle. Tristan Wade, Rashad Wisdom, Nate Gaines. Not going to spend a lot of time here because I think it's easy. No disrespect to Nate Gaines. But I think Tristan Wade would be first safety for me, followed by Rashad Wisdom. Uh, Nate Gaines is also awesome as well. So I'm going to put this stuff. I'm going to make a little graphic, and I'm going to put this stuff up on uh, – I'm going to put this stuff up on Twitter, and I want to see how many people throw eggs at me. But we'll see. Should be fun. Let's get to some of your comments before we roll into the next topic. Um, so back to the UTSA basketball thing. Just a, just, just kind of a question. I guess there, some of you guys are answering it now. I asked about, you know, what's going on with the coach. I did hear about his contract. Um, and last year we didn't fire him because we would have owed him money. That's interesting. What's weird about that to me is how are we getting into a situation and it feels like it's a little often it feels like it's more often than what it should be but it seems like we get we we get into these situations where we have some coaches and some of this stuff is over the years but we just end up owing owing them a lot of money when we get rid of them like what what kind of contracts are we offering out there to be completely honest I mean, or we get, I mean, or do the coaches have all the leverage every time? I heard him talk after the game about like he hasn't talked to them about um, his future at UTSA. He probably knows he's not coming back, right? And I think if he does come back, we need to start looking at the decision makers with a with the question. I don't, I haven't even been following the basketball thing, but if enough of the fan base 
is calling for your job as aggressively as um, they're calling for his, that's Red Flag City. It's Red Flag City. Uh, yeah, that's weird. If you, I'm, I, I'm thinking about adding UTSA basketball coverage for next season. If you guys are at all interested in that, let me know. Um, and I'll start doing that anyway. Next one. Okay. It's raps that he go David Morgan Oscar digressed, uh, digressed this year. Did he really? Yes. Yeah, here's the thing. I'll say this, Oscar, it's, he might've digressed um, statistically, right? I'm sure he digressed, digressed or, or regressed statistically this year, but like the way that our offense now utilizes the tight end, he's more of a safety blanket and is not, he's not necessarily someone who is, you know, He's not necessarily someone that's going to be heavily involved in the game plan week in and week out. Obviously, he's going to be the safety blanket for third, you know, third and fours. And if you need, if you get him up the seam or something like that, you know, he's going to be able to take a hit from a safety that's coming downhill. He's he's almost not necessarily a utility player, but he's not going to be your first, second, or even third option most of the time. So um, his production is never going to look great. I do like what I've heard from him in terms of he's going to try to lose some weight so he can make himself a better prospect for the NFL. I think that's a good call. I think that's a good move. And that means he's going to come into next season with a chip on his shoulder, really trying to prove something because he's going to try to be making it to that next level. Right. So um, I'm that's going to tie in the, the Oscar discussion is going to tie into the next topic or one of the next topics we have here on the docket. Um, and I think him making that commitment to lose some of that weight, to trim down a little bit, to put himself in a better position is something that, that I think is, is, is huge, but I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, Scott B says, uh, he has two of the biggest catches in school history. Yep. Um, it's rap said, let's keep it true to UTSA players. If they leave, they should, they shouldn't be an all team. They left the team, in my opinion. I'm not mad at that, honestly. And that's ultimately what I, I that's ultimately what I did. Cause I went back and I took out Franklin and added Cam Jones. And then even though I think Cam Alexander probably has the highest ceiling of all these corners, maybe not Tariq Woolen, but um he's probably got a higher ceiling than Corey Mayfield and Bennett. I didn't include him because um he left for Oregon. So yeah, I'm with you, bro. Scott says Tawefa absolutely put him on. Tawefa was a beast. So much talent, so much talent wasted. I'm curious to own this one. What do you mean so much talent wasted here? I think he did quite well at UTSA. I, I, I think he did quite well. I mean, listen, did he probably leave a year earlier than what he should have? Yeah. But at that point where you're putting up numbers like that, I, I to be fair, as good as he was, the NFL is a different level, and I don't know if that extra year would have done changed anything. You think it would have? If he would have stayed that extra year, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Hundred percent. Okay. Um, here's another thing I seen on Twitter this week that I wanted to talk about. And this is more so predicated around um, UTSA football season tickets. So I was I was sort of um, reading I was so I was sort of reading uh, some of the comments and stuff on Twitter, and I seen some folks making some complaints. They were talking about the UTSA parking situation and how the season tickets go out. And they're on sale or whatever. And in order to get parking passes, you have to donate a certain amount to the Roll Runner Athletic Fund. Has it always been that way? I get the sense that it has. It, it wasn't. It hasn't based on some of the comments I've seen. But you know, for those of you, or if anybody's is here is in in um in the chat who were season ticket holders. 
Has that always been the case? I think that um, either way, whether it's whether it's been the, been the case or not, there has always been a problem and complaints about going to the UTSA football games at the Alamo Dome, and the parking situation is just never great. You got to park on the side of the street somewhere. You got to hope that your car doesn't get towed if you don't have a parking pass or something like that. The parking situation is always atrocious. Um, or maybe you just have to like get a hotel, you know, for folks who are coming in, they would get a hotel and just walk over. I feel like it's probably one of the reasons that folks aren't packing the dome the way that, you know, it probably could be packed. And I think one thing about people, especially when they want to go somewhere and they, they want to have a good time is they want convenience. I'm, I am a hundred percent that way. Convenience is, um, I think a big deal when it comes to somebody going out there and spending their money on entertainment, you don't want to take, you don't want to have to, you know, walk two miles to get into the dome um, to watch a game. That sucks. Some people, Trust me, I'm sure there's a lot of people who just say, I'm not going to the game on the weekend for anything, you know, because I don't want to walk or the parking is going to be hectic or I can't get there whenever I want um, due to whatever's going on. So, um, yeah, I I think they it'd be it'd be better. It'd be great for them to to address some of that. I think we seen I, I seen someone respond. I think someone that's within the UTSA ticket department or something like that they responded to one of the posts uh that somebody put and they basically said that there's 2500 parking spots for 30,000 people like hypoth hypothetically right um and there's just not enough spots to go around so they have to you know and i understand that but i understand that to a degree but like is it not possible to to I don't know, create other parking scenarios in the area so it can be easier for folks to get to the games. Just a thought. Just a thought. Scott B says, that's the case for all college football, though, right? Have you ever been to a Texas game impossible to park downtown Austin? It happens with the influx of people. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a problem. It's always a problem. Um, you go to any event downtown and Austin. To be fair, though, to be fair, they got to figure. I know it's not as many people. Well, I don't know. It's not as many people, but they do got to figure it out at the Moody Center. <laughs> have you ever been to Austin and went to like a like they have the Spurs games that come up here? They have um, you know UFC events uh, at the Moody Center. They have big you know Kevin Hart's come down here and did a, did a, a show and. They have a lot of big stuff in the mo at the Moody Center. Downtown Austin is just a freak show, but I will say the parking is very organized. They can they it's very organized to get in and it's very organized to get out. The one thing I just don't like though, I've never liked, and I understand your point though about like it's like that everywhere. It's impossible to park with all these people coming in. I can I completely get it. Everything's overrun, um, but. I know even back when I was, I know back when, when I was there playing, I just remember all the gripes and students and folks not wanting to, or not being willing to um, jump over some of the hurdles to get to um, the games period. Tell you, man, folks who want to um, folks who want to, go and enjoy themselves for games. They're going to, they're going to want convenience hundred percent. It's rap says, I'm assuming that they're mad because they want a spot to tailgate. They messed up losing the sunset station. Cause that push parking passes for tailgate needs to be finite. Is that what it is? Is that what's happening? I don't know. Maybe so. Maybe so. It's, um, I don't know. It's just an interesting. It's just an interesting situation with that. I'm gonna do one more topic here. 
Where's Angela at? Because I'm going to tell her her 6 o'clock theory, I don't know if it's working well. <laughs> or it could just be slow news day, which is cool too. There we go. All right. So the last one I want to touch on, the last topic I want to touch on here. All right. One more thing before we get into this topic. I'll go to It's Rab's uh, comment here. He says, I think it's frat tailgates. Uh, I think it's I think it's frat tailgates moved into the parking lot, which they uh, used to be where the current alumni tailgate is. I think frat tailgates moved into the alumni parking lot. Ah, okay. Interesting. Interesting. We'll see. Let's see. I voted for five thirty. Yet I still be here at six. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of folks who voted six on that poll. <laughs> I'm just giving folks a hard time. Spring break. It is spring break, right? Probably so. And I knew that would. I knew that would probably be the case too. So I did a little bit of extra stuff to prepare for it as well. I'm. I'm. I'm just. I'm just giving folks a hard time, folks. Nah, I'm not. I'm okay. I'm happy that you guys are here with me, though. I am. I am happy about that. Um, but I probably won't be going to an hour. I'll probably wrap up after this last one. But this is a topic I did want to definitely talk talk about because I think that, um, in my opinion, it is going to be something that is going to be important next year, right? I think when you think about UTSA over the last, you know, two, three years. We've had leadership just not only because we've had guys that's been there for a long time, but you just think about you have a leader in Frank Harris that folks are going to follow by nature of him being a quarterback who has really taken the mantle of that team and pushed the team forward. You've had a Rashad Wisdom who's been a vocal leader and there's been someone that's out in the public eye and advocating for the team and doing his thing alongside of Frank Wilson. So you had that, 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 that main state leader on offense and that main state leader on defense. And those guys go out every day and every week and they put in, you know, eight out of 10, nine out of 10, some games, 10 out of 10 performances. And you can expect that from them on a consistent basis. To me, that's a real important thing because if you have leaders who are not putting in the shift every week, who are not uh, eight, at least averaging an eight out of 10 performance every game, things get rocky. Teams get rocky because, you know, it's like anything. Leaders get challenged. Are you really leading? How, how can you lead from, the, from, from behind and that sort of thing? That's a real thing that naturally plays out a lot. And it's one thing that I'm a little bit worried about, if I'm being completely honest, whenever I think about next year, I was sitting – Whenever today I was thinking through topics and I was thinking through um, the show rundown today, one of the things I was thinking about was who's the leader for UTSA? Who's the face of the program right now? I I don't know, to be completely honest. Is it Oscar? But, I mean, you know, I mean, it's rap said, you know, Oscar regressed last season, you know? So, like, is it Oscar? Can it be Oscar? I think – He's someone that I would say, you know what, Oscar is, you know, is probably going to step up and be a leader of the team. And I'm sure he will. Right. But to the point um, it's rap, man, you got to be making plays day in and day out to really, really embody that. And then, though, like knowing that Oscar's coming back for one more hoorah, you know, who's being mentored, who's being put in a position to be that big time leader you would think it would be a Kavorian Barnes well Kavorian Barnes he has a pretty stiff position battle this 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 year right you know it's not gonna be one of those situations I'm sure folks are gonna get behind uh JT Clark but you know you also gotta look at his situation too he's gonna he he's a leader by default I'm sure he's gonna be a leader in the face for that team I've seen a lot of him this offseason already um, just on the social media. But whenever I think about his journey coming into this season, and I think that's he's somebody that can get behind because he is a proven player who 
has been a big time player for UTSA. And if he's healthy, he's going to be a big time player for UTSA um, in 2024. And he is somebody 100% that we can get a uh, eight, you know, average eight out of 10 performance game in and game out. Whenever you, whenever, if he's playing and if he's healthy, you know that that dude is going to make it shake. He's, he, he's going to do what he's going to do what he's got to do to be able to get us wins hundred percent. But it's one of those things where we have a young quarterback and every time, a lot of the times you look at your quarterback to be the leader of the team and you want them to be, to be the leader of your team. But every now and again, you get these unique situations where now we have a young quarterback coming in and taking the place um, of a quarterback who has been historical for the for the for the program. Now, when you have those situations, um, you know, he you just. It's just something that like he's just not gonna walk in there and a hundred percent be be the leader. Like the new guy's not gonna hundred percent gain the trust of the fan base, gain the trust of the team. You gotta go out there and prove it. None of the guys that we have right now has went out and proved anything, right? They've come in, they've they've had cameos and things like that, but they haven't been able to prove anything big time yet. So when I think about who's gonna lead the team on the offensive side of the ball. I don't know. Probably Big Oscar. If I had to, if I had to take a guess, I can just tell by the way the UTSA media has been doing for, um, you know, their coverage and things like that. They're kind of putting him up toward, putting him up there. I seen that he was mic'd up or something like that the other day. So I think he's the one that's 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 kind of taking that um, taking that role right now. But. It's I don't know that to me is going to be an interesting thing that we're going to all have to figure out. I think on the defensive side, there are more people in the position to do that. I think Jamal Ligon comes to mind for me just off the muscle. I think he is someone that has been here for a while. He ain't going nowhere. He, you know, he gives you an eight out of 10 performance game in and game out. I think he's really, really good. He's really, really talented um, on that defensive side of the ball. But, yeah, I, I think he is a no-brainer on the defensive side. And I don't know if he's a vocal leader or anything like that, but um, it, it'll be interesting to see who the coach starts to put in front of the press conference, you know, put in front of the press a lot before the season. Not necessarily the spring, but in August, who's the coach going to be – who's the coach going to be put in front of the cameras a lot? Because that will let you know who is taking control of that team from the player standpoint in this off season, in the spring, in the summer, and then in fall camp. Let's get to some of your, um, all right. Scott says he likes Jamori. Yeah. I listen. Yeah. I, I, I my thing is I want to see somebody step up and take it. Right. That's it. Like step up and, 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 and come out as that, as that person, Jamal Ligon, Kim Robinson. Yeah, absolutely. Jamal Ligon. I, I, um, I agree with that 100%. I think he probably will be one of those. I'm not as concerned about the defense, not in terms of what they'll play, but I think there are some guys on that defense that have at least the on the field box checked in terms of does this person have what it takes to be considered a leader and someone that's going to galvanize the troops on that side of the ball. I think the defense has that in a Jamal Ligon. Offensively is where I'm a little – worried about it because we we have uncertainty at the quarterback position at this particular point in time we don't have a clear some we don't have a clear person like we had with sincere mccormick back in the day or jarvie young williams at that running back position like we had we thought we had one but we kind of have a three-headed monster system now and that's completely different right from a receiver standpoint there's a lot of talent there's a lot of new guys we have jt clark coming back and things like that but we don't we still Outside of JT Clark, but you know, you got to go back a couple seasons from that. Devin McEwen is probably not going to take that mantle just because he's he's still wet behind the ears as a freshman and stuff like that. So, I mean, may, maybe he can, some guys do, to be fair, but um, I wouldn't expect that from him. I wouldn't expect that, but we'll see. We'll see. It's rap says I think it'll end up being a classic leader by position. 
but we just need to see who is going to be with the 210 numbers to get clarifications this coming year. Yeah, I, I think that the 210 numbers will definitely give us some clear, some clarity on who the coach is looking at as leaders. But we ain't going to learn that for, for a while, right? So, you know, I think this offseason, this summer, that's going to be – it's just going to be huge for those guys to go in and um, develop. And I'm, I'm sure the coaches are rolling out the balls and, and seeing who's, who's, who's going to really come in and play ball. That to, me is go- that, to me, is huge, man. I'm telling you, like, leaders like that and stuff like that, they set the tone. You'd be surprised. Like, I just remember back in the Eric Sosa days, and this is – I mean, I was obviously playing, so I'm just kind of giving you guys my experience. Um, and we struggle with that so bad. Like y'all just don't know, like whenever we first came into UTSA and I'm peeling back the curtain a little bit, we came into UTSA at 2010, original 18, the original class. We were all freshmen. They got all the guys who came in, like there were other guys. We had like a Mark Waters and you had a Marlon Smith. You had older guys on the team who were, um, you know, juniors and seniors and stuff like that. But they came from JUCO. They came from other places and things like that. But they weren't on scholarship, right? So the scholarship guys at the time got more of the attention. You got more of the perks of what it is of being at a team, so on and so forth. And, like, the pecking order, if I'm just being completely honest, the pecking order at times ran through who was on scholarship and who wasn't. It just did. That's just a fact. Now, a lot of those guys eventually earn scholarships and things like that, of course, and then leaders and stuff start to be established a lot more. But it was something that we struggled with. I can remember, like, uh, I I can't I, I ah man I don't want to at some point I'll give names I'm gonna ask them one day if I can give names but I can remember I can t- I'll just give you guys a little peel back on the curtain of how bad some of the leadership stuff was and I'm sure you, I don't know how much of this you guys have heard before but if you knew the off season if you guys knew the percentage of people who showed up that first year to off season workouts because they were optional. You you guys wouldn't have came to one game. You wouldn't have came to one game. It was embarrassing. Me included. Me included. My numbers were not great. Um, we didn't have anybody there to to to, to our coaches weren't even um our coaches weren't even it was one of those things where because the program was so new and we didn't even have a, we didn't have a season at first and stuff like that. Like they were very wet behind the ears around a lot of this stuff either. And, and because we didn't have a season, like it's not like they didn't take it serious, but um, the, the, I think we were, we were just under a magnifying glass on like, how how much what we could say or what they could say to us in terms of what's mandatory and what wasn't mandatory i can tell you right now that 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 not mandatory we really took that as not mandatory so we went when we wanted to we went to to work out so we wanted to not everybody obviously you had people who were 100% your david glasgows was there 100% back in the day your farrington makins was 100% your Eric Sosa's those guys would never ever miss a day but there were so many people on the team that just wouldn't yeah we were having like 40 50% attendance at that time it was not great and i can remember as time went on and as we start having a um as we start having seasons it all start to change that first year, it all started to change. After we had our first football season, going into that next summer, okay, everything started to be a little bit different. We start to get it a little bit more, right? We started to follow our our quarterback's lead or or our position 
person's lead because we got smacked in the mouth, went four and six. We deserve to go four and six, 100%. Went four and six that next season. But we progressively got better. And the workouts, eventually, by the time my sophomore, junior year came, yeah, like the workouts were were non-mandatory, but they were mandatory. Yeah, that was first couple of years. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. It was funny. I remember going back to my hometown on break and I would talk to my other, my former high school teammates who were um, in college as well. And they were in division one colleges as well. And we were talking about, you know, guys were like, yeah, I got to get back. Cause I got workouts. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got work. I got, I, I got to get back. Yeah. I'm, I'm only here for two days. I got workouts on Monday. If I miss, I'm in trouble. And I'm like, I didn't say anything at the time, but in my mind, I'm like, yo, it's not like that at UTSA right now. It's just not. Like, you could just be like, hey, coach. You know, I mean, I'm sure to a degree a lot of that stuff happens still now. Like, if guys need to go home and they want to see their folks, you can ask for permission to do something like that. Like, that happens all the time. You're not slaves to it. But what I mean is um, the if you don't have leadership, it will reflect – tenfold on the field that first year we didn't have leaders there were guys walking and running around trying to force leadership into us um on our team was trying to force leadership and it was bad nobody cared about it people made fun of it and it wasn't natural it just wasn't because nobody was proven yet that's sort of my whole point right once things start to get proven on that field then folks follow that's kind of how it worked. So obviously UTSA has come a long way and like that type of stuff isn't happening anymore. I know that for a fact. And I, I know guys now, if you miss anything, you're out of the program hundred percent. And it got like that. Don't get me wrong. Like it got like that. It was just one year where it was just really, really bad. Um, Cause a lot of this stuff wasn't getting back to Coker. That's the thing. A lot of it wasn't getting back to Coker. Um, well, some of yeah, that's not true. That's not true. Actually, it's not true. But, um, yeah, I mean, we, you've seen us over time, the re we went four and six and we went 75, went eight and four. We were better every time after that. And that's because there was just, there was, there was just clarity about who we're following. So whenever I look at, at UTSA now, we haven't been in this sort of position in a long time where now we are depending on new leaders to come in and lead the team as players. To me, that is a lot more of a big deal than folks will make it. Um, and it's just because you just got to understand how locker rooms work and what motivates guys and, and things like that, you know, just – that that type of stuff is super important. So anyway, I'll stop ranting on, on about that, but just to peel back the curtain a little bit on what a program looks like whenever there is no, there is a lack of leadership until it's developed. And it's not like guys weren't trying to be or didn't have leadership qualities. It's just once you get on that field and you start to prove yourself, that's when people will follow you. Anyway. I'm off. I'm off that now. Um, also, I was saying Tower Effa talent was wasted by coaching at UTSA. Really? That's interesting. That's an interesting take. Josiah Tower Effa's talent was wasted by coaching at UTSA. Interesting. Yeah, I think that. I don't think his final year was as good as it could have been. I think they started to move him around a little too much. That's just my personal opinion, but I still thought he was excellent. Um, you would have liked to see him in a in, in this Jeff Trailer system, though. Yeah, I think you would we would have liked to see him in that. I think he would have thrived. I think he would have thrived. Um, let's see. Carol B says that's wild workouts not being mandatory. Carol, if, if you <laughs> Those early days, we were not a stable program. And we shouldn't have been. We were brand new. We were brand new. Not a stable program at all. Um, looks like I'll wrap it up there. I definitely didn't expect to go this long today. 
I am I'm I'm hoping this was just spring break. Um but I'm I'm gonna try the six o'clock again next week. If things if we don't get enough participation and, and enough people on, I'll pro I'll I might consider moving it back to five thirty. I do six o'clock does help me a little bit to be completely honest. Um but people were calling calling for 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 the six o'clock time frame. So it's probably just spring break or something like that. Um, and maybe I, I, I didn't do a good enough job of promoting it that that could very well be that as well. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and wrap up here. Remember guys like the video so folks can, uh, catch this also subscribe if, if you're here for the first time and then also for members, um, um, or if, if you're not a member, you would like to join, um, be sure to do that. I have the link to join as a member in the video description and yeah, leave any super chats to donate to the channel. Um, I would really, really appreciate that. I am trying to invest in a new camera. That, that'll be something huge because we got a lot of plans going on for the rest of this year. But thank you guys for being here. I will see you guys next week. Oh, I forgot. Last thing. This is for everybody who's here uh, to this particular point in time. I have a special uh, guest coming up. Uh, the members, like I said, if you are a member, I have already made that announcement. I made that announcement. Um, in a separate video that was members only. So that was only went out to the members, but I am going to share with you guys just for you to be on the lookout. But I am going to have in studio Jarvion Williams. He's coming down to Austin. We're going to be in the studio and uh, we're going to go through all of the, all of it. I'm going to ask him some, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff, obviously about more recent UTSA stuff, but I, I want to also ask him some stuff about the Frank Wilson era um, and just his experience with UTSA and San Antonio and what, what he's expected for 2024 as well. It's going to be a lot of good conversations and talks with that. That is probably going to come out sometime over the weekend. We're shooting that on Friday. It's going to pro we're probably going to need a day or two for post-production, and then I'm either going to put that out on uh, Saturday if we can or maybe on – Maybe I might hold it to Monday. I don't think Sunday is ever really a good time, but maybe hold it to Monday. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, but I am signing off. I'm going to go get some dinner and take a load off. See you guys.